So uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I don't have a mic, so if you can't hear me, just kind of wave. I'll increase my volume. Um, so I lead one of the software teams uh, in, uh, at level five. So the software teams I lead typically work more on understanding the environment, uh, things like maps, things that don't move, understanding how other drivers drive, uh, also understand how to capture all the scenarios and behaviors that a self-driving car needs to be able to successfully show that it can perform so that we can assess readiness uh, for its safety. So, uh, we also do a whole bunch of machine learning uh, and cloud operations. There's another software team uh, that mostly operates the software that runs in the car. So we kind of separate the environment from the software that runs in the car. Uh, Johnny, who is also a colleague, he runs the hardware team. He builds the cars. So in some sense, these are the software and hardware teams that are the main organizations in level five. Level five is run by Luke, uh, Luke Vincent. Uh, he was originally going to give the talk, but uh, he couldn't make it sound sort of his uh, placement. Uh, in terms of, uh, get this going. So let me start with a story. Uh, I'm going to try to focus on things that are sort of different uh, from the way we think about building self-driving cars at Lyft. Uh, Building flight driving cars, autonomous, is a very, very broad field. There's many specializations. And I've kind of chosen a few topics that I felt were unique to the way Lyft approaches the self-driving problem, and also for the audience. I think you will find that this has more of a broader appeal to transportation in general than just going deep on something like perception or robotics. So, so if you're one of those experts, you may find that the talk is a little bit shallow. But hopefully, there's enough here to, to make it interesting for uh, most of the audience. So let me start with 30 years ago, right? You know, uh, it's sort of close to when I was doing uh, my LA PhD research work. AI had, you know, chess as one of the big challenges. Till then, if you think of 1989, uh, IBM had a computer called Deep Thought, and this was the one that was the best chess player at that time. And if I were to ask you in 1989, you know, or go back 30 years, maybe 31, because it's 2020 now. Kind of put the slides together last year. The, will a computer ever be able to beat a human at chess? Okay. In 1989, how many people would have said yes? A few people. Like, if you're in the field, you're like, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. But the general audience were like, oh, it's not going to happen. And interestingly, Kaspar was about to play Deep Thought, and he actually played two games, and he beat Deep Thought at both of them in 1989. And Kaspar has a certain style. I love the guy, but you know he's known for making sensational statements. So he's like, you know, he would have saved me a bunch more time if the programmer programmed the computer to resign earlier, because I knew it was over long before the computer knew that it was over. Right? So a little bit of snark there. Uh, the time goes forward, 89 to 96. 1996, Deep Thought has been replaced with the successor, Deep Blue. Castro plays it and beats it again. Right. Now I'm fast forwarding to one more year after that, which is 1997. And at this time, you know, the world had actually started to really think that it was a matter of when rather than if a computer will be better than a human at chess. Right? And so Castro played a rematch. This was a full tournament style, seven games, and until, uh, until, and until it has a champion. And interestingly, Deep Blue wins the seven game match with one point ahead. And this was just the amount of hype at that time. They felt chess was like the last AI problem that kind of differentiated humans from, from computers. Right? This was still like 20 plus years ago. Right? So we know that, that that's happened. We moved on. If you look at why Kasparov lost, or why Deep Blue won, you, know, you, you can ask yourself, OK, what is the difference between when computers started to play chess to when they finally got good enough to be a human, you can go look at the tabloids. You know, there's still people who are like, oh, Kasparov really didn't lose to the computer. Kasparov lost to Kasparov. Because he didn't train against a computer, and the computer plays differently from humans. And if only he had trained against a computer, he would have beaten it. Right? And so uh, there's, there's still people who feel like the problem is not really a true test. It'll continue. Right? However, if you really, really ask people who built these and continue to build specialized AI systems. What helped Deep Blue win? 
there are three components to it. Right? There's definitely hardware involved. Uh, they built a special purpose computer, a chip that could actually evaluate of the order of 100 million boards per second. Kasparov could probably do 50 in his head. And that's, I mean, computers beat humans because they're massively compute intensive compared to what humans evaluate. Right? And so that was hardware. They actually had hardware teams that would build chess hardware to play more, I mean, I would say, think farther ahead. Software also, they did algorithms. <coughs> so alpha, beta, mega scout searches their alpha, beta algorithms that allow you to see much farther without having to brute force your way because it's an exponentially hard problem if you want to evaluate everything. Uh, so you can do nice branch and bound and alpha, beta is one very efficient implementation for that. Right. And then the third one is the one I'm going to spend a little bit of time on. <laughs> third one is knowledge. And you can call this somewhat cheating, right? In a traditional sense, you look up the answer, you don't really solve for it. Right? And what they found was that in the opening game and in the end game, you could pretty much solve the problem. Mate in one, if you're a chess player, that's a nice fun set of puzzles, but once you have that, you don't have to compute it again. Because it's, and there were the people who were doing PhDs writing theses about how to take a 440 trillion end game database and pack it into a IBM deep thought machine. Because then you could solve all six piece or seven piece end game. So you didn't have to think once the board had less than six or seven pieces, you're like, I can tell what the outcome's gonna be. So there's also opening game. Opening game, the problem with opening game is you have too many pieces, too many moves, you just, and, and the, the, the gradient is very, very low. So every move kind of sort of looks the same because you're not losing a piece or winning a piece. Nothing's changing dramatically fast. And middle game is where the fan out is the worst. So opening game, they kind of uh, eliminate all the traps. If you're new to chess, you'll fall to a lot of chess traps. Most of that is because you don't have an opening book. A computer will never fall to that because most of them have already been logged away. Right? And the last one, last one's the interesting one. They use Grandmaster games to learn and if you look at some of the early AIs, they were trying to do imitation learning from Grandmaster games. Uh, sort of similar problems to what we see today with imitation learning for other AI problems. Solutions are brittle. They do well against the Grandmaster, but sometimes amateurs trick those to manage doesn't work so well. And the last one is a lot of heuristics. Computer science is really applied heuristics. Domain expertise is injected into your algorithm via heuristics, and these are, they work beautifully in that space. A ton of that. So long story short, there's a lot of knowledge that goes into it. And I'm gonna talk about knowledge as a way of you know, solving the self driving problem in a uniquely different way. And in that sense, this talk will be slightly different. So if I were to now come back and ask, this is 2020 now, this is 2019, 2020, 30 years later, how many of you think cars will become better than humans at driving safely? So about half, okay. So it's much closer than uh, what chess was like uh, in 30 years ago, right? So let me talk about what does it mean for a, a, uh, an AI to drive a car. Uh, these, these are the level, you know, there's levels one, two, three, four, five. SAE has a, has a taxonomy to it. Most of you probably have heard of it. When we talk about building a self-driving car or a driverless car, we're really targeting level four. Level four says that you do not need a driver, most important. Second thing is, there's a limitation to the set of environments that the car can operate in, right? It's not like you can drop the car anywhere in, on Earth or on Mars and it'll just go and, and navigate itself safely, right? So level five is sort of aspirational, super hard. Uh, but level four is really good. Up to level three, a lot of the systems you will hear ADAS, uh, automated driver assist, that actually allows you to go from simple cruise control to automatic cruise control all the way. You still need a human till about here, or a, what we would call a safety driver. So I'm gonna claim that to win at self-driving, you need all three. You need a really good set of sensors. <coughs> you need really good software. A lot of it is vision, robotics, complex, uh, and scalable, highly efficient real-time software that can reason with that input, make decisions carefully, and then execute on those and control the car. Uh, and the last one is knowledge. Uh, and Similar to your opening game databases, end game databases, your killer heuristics, and grandmaster games, I'm gonna talk about some parallels that you can draw to how you can apply that to self-drive. But before I get to that, let me talk about why knowledge is even an interesting thing to talk about. And I'll talk a little bit about Lyft. You can build a self-driving car in a company that has a ride-sharing product, like Lyft, or you can build it 
in a company that does not have a ride sharing product. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Lyft from the point of view of what does Lyft have in terms of knowledge that will help you build a better self-driving car or build a self-driving car faster than if you did not have that part. So the Lyft's, Lyft's mission is actually very transportation centric. Right? The mission is to improve people's lives with the world's best transportation. And the best is the key one. So you try and think about how to go about solving the trans transportation problem holistically. And self-driving is one part of how to make that happen. If you look at our scale, this is uh, about a year old, this graph. But if you look at the number of rides, which are a full experience from pick up to drop off, in about a week, about 50 million rides are served. These rides are about five to seven miles long on average. So you're looking at about 350 million miles of driving across the US. We operate mostly in the US. And almost 95% of the population has access to, to this kind of, uh, the data has access. So this is a cap capability that Lyft has today. And you will see how Lyft <coughs> can sort of, the way they produce these experiences for ride sharing are by understanding the data, by understanding users' needs, and solving for uh, a matchup between the two. And the kind of revolution that this particular self-driving slash ride sharing is pushing for is to move from vehicle ownership, which is very inefficient from several aspects, to more of a transportation as a service. And this has several benefits towards both utilization, towards time to delivery, time to arrival, and also eliminates a lot of the you know, inefficiencies that exist in transportation. So what do I mean by transportation knowledge? Right? It's not just to cars or to just ride sharing, but you can think of Lyft as having knowledge across many different aspects of transportation. Like how do you operate a fleet? Right? That requires some understanding, both in terms of the fleet drivers, fleet owners, so you have like local local operations. Some, most people don't know this, but Lyft is also one of the largest rental car companies, not just a ride share company. If you want to drive for Lyft and you don't have a car, you can rent a car under Express Drive is our product, one of the products we have there. Okay. Uh, we're kind of, we also work with other rental car companies to sort of augment and uh, have you rent cars from them to ride for them. Now, it's also multimodal, many modalities, not just cars, but you can think of scooters, bikes, the whole end, and we want to solve it. Uh, and also connecting you with transit. Like you may, to, in order to solve your transportation need, have both public transportation and combination of multimodal, uh, both, and self-driving will be part of that, that ecosystem. And the last one is uh, what we would, like shared rides is another one where you also want to solve the collective problem to improve both efficiencies and reduce costs. So lots of transportation knowledge. When we think of the scale at which the number of rides are there, the number of miles you actually drive uh, as part of the platform, uh, this allows you to really understand the transportation, uh, both the existing state, the needs, the problems itself. So part of helping solve the transportation problem or bring the best transportation services, self-driving is part of that. And self-driving's focus is sort of aligned, and there are specific things that self-driving really cares about. They're also aligned with what the users really want. One is they want safer ride, right? And if you're the driver driving your own car, the safety is your responsibility, and uh, that's sort of part of your responsibility. You may be distracted, you may not always be paying attention. Uh, at the same time, there's other drivers. Even if you're a safe driver, you're putting yourself at risk. So an AV, even if you're not driving the AV or you're not part of the AV, you'll still be safer if AVs are good at uh, safety. The second one is reliability. Uh, if you are, live in downtown or congested areas, your car may actually be quite far away from you. So things like ETAs, getting in and out of parking lots, uh, there's a lot of inefficiency and in terms of your, you getting reliably available access to transportation in a timely way. So ETAs and things like that are pretty variable. The last two are more around uh, affordability. Because you, cars are the second most uh, expensive asset that 
uh, many Americans invest in, you're not getting as much value out of that investment. So if you really think about the value you're getting, transportation as a service has the ability to, to provide a large fraction of users uh, a better affordability price point than if you were to own a car. And then the last one is experience. And this is more um, rides are consistent and they're personalized. So you actually have a, a, a clean fleet uh, that serves your needs. Quick note on strategy. Uh, I'm, the, I'm talking about self-driving cars, which is part of level five. But Lyft also has open platform. So when you think about a self-driving car, you can think about a single car that you're building, which is sort of like solving the autonomy problem. But you can also think of fleet of AVs. And also you can think about the whole market. So we have an open platform that allows any partner that has a self-driving car to be able to connect with the marketplace that matches these AVs with human, drive, human riders to sort of participate in the overall problem. So overall, there's many product features in the, in the main ride-sharing side that actually use the knowledge that we have about transportation and serve specific features that allow Lyft to provide a really good ride-sharing service. Some of the examples are around like vehicle positioning. Right? If you can predict uh, demand for, for rides, you can position and you can highlight or hint the drivers to move to that location. With humans, you work through the driver app. With an AV, you can just sort of programmatically and, and sort of at a much higher pace and much higher reliability sort of operate a fleet in terms of positioning. So I'm going to come back to self-driving. Uh, like I mentioned, there's three parts, hardware, software, and knowledge. For completeness, I'm going to quickly cover the hardware and software pieces and then move to some examples of knowledge. Okay. So we have a Gen 2 car. This is, like, this is our second generation uh, vehicle. It mostly is uh, a stock car with additional sensors. So sensors are a big part of the hardware that goes on it. This particular car, if you look at it, it's got three LIDARs. There's one on the right fender, one on the left fender at the corner, and then one uh, uh, roof-mounted uh, LIDAR. There's a bank of cameras you can see at the top. Um, it also has radar that are behind the, the housing. And what you don't see is there's a trunk full of computers. It's just, think of like a data center rack. It's pretty beefy, lots of GPUs. This thing generates a lot of heat. There's a lot of power. And then there's control systems that actually control the car using uh, the actual automotive capability. That's right. So lots of, if you look at from the top, there's also sensors that are, the sensor suite is meant to be complementary. No one sensor, is a, there's no such thing as a killer sensor. Like you know, those of you who've studied sensors, LiDAR is one that is super powerful. And it, in some sense, LiDAR serves the most broad set of capabilities. Uh, whereas cameras are much cheaper, cameras are more ubiquitous, cameras are dense sensors, LiDAR is a sparse sensor, so it's not always easy to see things in full fidelity, whereas cameras are much easier. But at nighttime, cameras don't do so well. Cameras are passive, so they collect photons, so if there are no photons around you, you can't sense the things you want to sense. Whereas LiDAR, on the other hand, similar to radar, is an active sensor. It actually emits energy out, and looks for, for reflections. And, and so it works great in caves, nighttime. <laughs> it doesn't have a problem. But it is sparse, so that, that's one problem. Now, both cameras and LIDARs have a problem with moisture in the air. So if you have fog, none of them will actually uh, penetrate things like visual occlusions, uh, especially environmental factors. Uh, moisture causes the specific frequencies that the laser uh, the LiDAR lasers use, LEDs use, to basically scatter. So you don't, you never don't get good returns. Same thing with, so something like radar is super powerful. Radar can easily penetrate a lot of the typical visual occlusions if you see things like smoke, uh, fog, and so on. Problem with radar is it doesn't really have much of an azimuth. And it actually has somewhat of a, there's known issues like multipath. It can tell you the size of the object roughly, but it can't give you like really highly accurate size information. But it has Doppler, beautiful. Like with one scan, it can tell you how fast something is moving. Whereas something like a LiDAR or a camera, you need multiple frames or multiple sweeps to actually infer the depth of where the object is and the velocity of it is. 
So radar has, so overall the sensor suite is meant to be a combination and gives you like a robust set. There's also sonars for things that you want to see within a meter or two of where the car is because things are mounted on the roof. There's a shadow that falls so you can't really see things around the skirt of the car. And that's why when you look at an AV, you really need many of these sensors uh, to complete the, the software's ability to design stain lines. On the software side, there are a rich set of problems. And to solve the full AV problem, you run through a bunch of these. And I've kind of named about six of them. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about mapping and probably perception. Uh, and some and hint at some motion planning stuff that you can do to relate to it. But the key thing about this software is it has to run on the car. Uh, that there's a lot of compute in the back of the car, but just given the latencies involved and the speeds at which these cars move, there's no way you're going to be able to talk to anything outside the car and have it come back in time for you to address the safety needs that are real, needed for a real time. And so most of it has to run embedded. Many of the systems here will run anywhere from 10 hertz to 100 or 200 hertz. So you have to be able to respond to things in 5 to 10 milliseconds. Uh, and again, highway speeds, you have to be able to see two to 300 meters out. So it's very demanding. Uh, so the onboard systems tend to be highly optimized for that. And the smart there is both in terms of solving the hard problems like perception and prediction, and also figuring out what to do planning, planning wise, but also sort of do that in a way where you don't have to do a lot of compute. And we'll talk about how knowledge, like I mentioned, opening book in chess or end game databases in chess, you can pre-compute a bunch of stuff. So you're just looking it up. So that's a nice way to sort of offload anything that doesn't need to be done on the car uh, to be done ahead of time and then you store it in a way that you can retrieve very efficiently. For completion, let me run through maybe the basic problems. So Mapping is the activity you do before the car starts. We'll talk a little bit about HD maps. So these are very rich environment, very rich representations of things that don't move in the world. And mapping to me is effectively a perception problem, but you're limiting yourself to things that don't move so that you can solve that problem ahead of time, index it nicely, and then retrieve it. As long as the world doesn't change that often, uh, you can pretty much solve a large part of your perception of static objects for you. You still want to verify online and sometimes the world does change, so you, you want some. But it's much easier to check for differences against a known map versus having to build the map while you run. And because things don't move, you can kind of, that, that's basically all my perception. The other thing you can also do is you can have a human in the loop. So if your perception system is only able to do 90% or 95% or 99% accurate, and you need something like, I can't miss even one traffic light in, in a city, and there may be 10,000 traffic lights, you need like five nines, very hard to get a 5.9 uh, AI based onboard perception system. So for things like traffic lights, which are super, super, super important, you can solve the problem at a time, run it through a bunch of humans, and basically make sure that you have really high fidelity. And that's what sort of mapping does. The very first thing the car has to do uh, before it reasons much more is, given a map, where is the car at any given time? And localization is the problem that solves that. So it tells you, and the accuracies there, are, I'll talk about mapping accuracy also. It has to be like centimeter level accurate. So five, 10 centimeters is really the tolerance that you have. It's not like GPS where you, when you see your blue dots on your favorite mapping app, that has a rough variance of about 10 meters. Um, so it's very good for like what road you're on, but not very good at what lane you're in or what side of the road you're on. Um, so that's sort of localization. So localization also estimates in like six dimensions. You have X, Y, Z yaw, pitch, and roll, so it has to be able to know exactly how the car is located so that it can reason about the objects that it's gonna detect with perception. So once you know where the car is, then you can use your sensor data to figure out what else is around me. You can say, ah, that's a car in my next lane. Oh, that's a traffic light. No, oh, that's a pedestrian. And so you can then place them relative to where you are and then also reason about where they are in the world uh, based on your perceptions. Perception is actually one of the, one of the main reasons Self-driving has become so accessible or people are so optimistic is that perception has had tremendous benefits in the last five, seven years since deep nets have come. So that's, that's sort of like a, a, one of the things that's fueling this, this particular technology. After perception, you go into 
planning. Planning has two parts. Once you know where you are and where the objects around you are, you can then figure out where they will be, as in like you can predict trajectories or tracks or future positions. And then once you know where the objects will be in the future, you can solve the problem of what should the car do, given a higher goal of wanting to pick up and drop off a, uh, a passenger from one location to another. Like, and that's the motion planner that does it. And then once you have a motion plan at a very high frequency, you try to then send commands to the control system to then have the car move in that direction. And the whole thing runs at a, at a pretty high uh, um, frequency, like tens of hertz. So you, most of the stuff is just redone uh, or updated several times. So let me jump to uh, knowledge. And I'll, I'll talk about the first ones, sort of the kinds of things that are important that don't move, which is part of the map. Uh, the map can be seen, at least at Lyft, we think of the map uh, as a partial solution to the autonomy problem that can be solved ahead of time. So the map will tell you many things that will help you get partial solutions or almost complete solutions for things you would have to solve online if you do not have a map. And there are strategies, there are claims that you probably don't need a map, you can build a map uh, while you're driving. But in our case, we kind of decided that the map is and we invest in building some really rich maps. And the maps will contain things like traffic lights, signs, and road markings, super important. Uh, maps are used everywhere. I won't go through everything, but I mentioned localization, perception, prediction, planning. Uh, some part of the map gets used uh, to solve either completely or partially the problem solved by these various software services. The map is also what we call it's layered, and I'll give you some examples. The base map is the same thing you have on your on your favorite mobile or desktop, um, what we call like a navigational map, or even in your car if you're navigating from one point to another today. And that's sort of the base map there. That's the same. And we try to build things on top of it. There's a geometric layer, which effectively tells you how space around you is occupied. And you may even be able to have basic simple things like the color, the density, intensity of these things. People think of them as either point clouds or voxels kind of like a very space occupation, 3D type of representation of the map. And then on top of it, you can reason and you can build a semantic map. Semantic map is where a lot of the post-processing happens. You know where the traffic lights are. You know where the lane markings are. You know where the yield relationships are. You know where the speed limits you know, for each section. Uh, you try and enrich that. Semantic map is where a lot of the reasoning and distilled decision-making inputs sort of come from. If you know the speed limit, you know how to then control to, to maintain that. If you know where the stop signs and stop lines are, you can kind of gauge how you should accelerate or decelerate to, to respect that. And the last two are interesting. There's a map prior layer, like I mentioned, not every, the first three are sort of solved. If things don't move, they're solved in a perfect way. But if you look at things that are partially solved, you can only provide a prior to an algorithm on that. So in a traditional sense, if you have a, a probabilistic model, the prior can help you sort of dramatically improve the, your prediction capability. But you still have to do some more work to kind of uh, to do that. And the last time is the real-time layer where things can talk to each other. So the very first one is, I think of this as pre-computation. Uh, these are two examples. These are uh, basically intersections around the Palo Alto Level 5 office. Um, what you're seeing is basically a projection of a 3D point cloud as an image. Uh, Point cloud is generated on the left side from the LiDAR data. LiDAR doesn't have color, but it does have distance and range and intensity. We combine that with camera data and color every LiDAR return. We also have solved a SLAM problem. So you, a LiDAR, when you're moving through space, will produce point clouds and you can aggregate them. And this is sort of like a, once you put them all in one geometric frame using, by solving a SLAM problem, you can actually render the point clouds. So you can see the fidelity, the fidelity is like super high. Um, on the left side, we've done the same thing using just off-the-shelf cameras, uh, like your typical smartphone level uh, sensor capability. So you can generate similar looking things at a slightly lower fidelity, but at much larger scales. And you'd solve something like a structure for motion type of problem. They're all computationally intensive, but you can scale them very nicely. Uh, so this is something that you can solve ahead of time and becomes sort of the foundation for mainly things like localization. If you want to know where you are, you can get one scan or one camera image. If you're having 
a visual, visual geometric map, you can use the camera image to figure out where you are, what your pose is, what, what your location is. Same thing with LiDAR, you can actually do scan matching uh, against a geometric map. The other thing, now once you have a geometric map, you want to sort of start deriving things that are more semantic. So one of the things, camera imagery has, like I said, vision has a lot of technologies. And in this case, you can actually segment the image into semantic elements, like the drivable surface, the lane markings, traffic lights, signs, buildings. And so that allows you to then go back and try to place these uh, semantic objects in the 3D space of the geometric map and then build out a semantic map. The key thing to understand is uh, the accuracy requirements are extremely high compared to like what we're normally used to. So for example, there's a bike lane that is between a right turn only lane and a straight lane, go through lane. If you look at the white lines that are the paint markings, they're anywhere from seven centimeters to 12 centimeters wide. So you have to kind of be able to reason at the centimeter level for those. The bike lane itself can be anywhere from about a meter to a meter and a, 1.2 meters. And the California law requires that you actually give them another three feet of space if you're ever passing a, a bicycle. Right? And so you want to be able to reason to know when to sort of merge and drive through a bike lane safely <coughs> before you execute a right turn. And all of that stuff requires you to reason to within like tens of centimeters and you know, fidelity is super important. So the semantic map and the geometric map have to have that fidelity. So once you run semantic uh, processing on your images and then you post-process, you generate something that looks like a lane geometry. It has, the accuracy here is, think of it as you can identify lanes pretty easily. You can also identify relationships, like which lanes connect to which lanes. You can see traffic lights, you can see crosswalks. So these are all derived from the data and that's what the semantic map represents. A nice thing is once you solve it ahead of time, you don't have to keep solving it every time you drive that route. This is another bird's eye view. Uh, we can actually overlay the semantic map onto the camera imagery at any given time. So you can always validate. Uh, you can, if you, I think one of the interesting things is humans are really, really good at bird's eye views. So when we do quality control, when we do editing, and when we do labeling, people really like a bird's eye view uh, representation. And so this is, these are the assets that go and become inputs to the planner so that if you want to stay in the left turn only lane, you have lane boundaries, and you can actually execute that pretty safely. And you only need to validate, rather than trying to solve the whole problem at runtime. So here's an interesting example. The, the, the map, uh, the way I think about it, perception, you can say it's offline perception, but great. One of the problems with online perception is occlusion. Right? If, if those of you, even just normal driving, if you have an 18-wheeler truck right next to you at an intersection, it just completely blocks your ability to sense what's on the other side. I mean, there, for dynamic objects, it's pretty dangerous. They tell you to be very careful when you're driving past a set of parked cars or a set of stop cars or a big 18-wheeler. But static objects, you know, if you want to see the speed limit, you can't see it at that point because you have occlusion. And at rush hour, you have a lot of occlusion. That's one of the reasons they try to put the sensors higher than the rest of the car so that you can at least peek around it. But trucks are higher <coughs> even there. So, the other ones is weather conditions. I mean, if you look at that picture, there's no way you're going to be able to see the lane boundaries. But if you've already mapped it before, you can see the stop sign. You can kind of, even if you can barely read it, you still have a map and you only need to validate it. So you can think of the map as a unique sensor that has some occlusion-free properties. It's a little stale because it's not the reality, but it also has infinite uh, distance for perceptions. Most sensors will tap out at a few hundred meters. Uh, you can even see around corners, and that's sort of how you do routing. That's one of the things I kind of like about no range limitations for the map. Uh, let's look at some map priors. Map priors are the ones where you, I'm talking a lot about maps, but I'm really talking about knowledge under the umbrella of what a map is. When you cannot solve a problem completely, how do you still bring that knowledge to the algorithms that you have? Okay. So I'll give you some examples of uh, use cases. <laughs> Detecting whether an object is going half a mile an hour or is parked is very hard. And you're like, nobody drives at half a mile an hour. Why do you care, Kumar? Well, when somebody's pulling out of the parking 
but you know, they are going to go from zero to maybe slowly coming in and then merge and then drive up. So you do have that, you know, maybe they're about to pull out of the parking spot, right? But rather than assuming that you have to solve that problem all the time, if you actually have a parking prior, that is, if you look at all the data you have, and offline you can figure out by post-processing the cloud all the parked cars you saw with a certain high fidelity, you can then find out what, what's the geometric footprint of where they are parked. Almost like asking for where are the parking spots that people normally park. And then you can have a prior that says, if you see a car with very low speed in that location, it's probably a parked car with a higher probability than if you see it in the middle lane where nobody will park. Right? It's probably a stop car behind a, a traffic light. So things like those are, those are super helpful. Uh, I'll give you an example of uh, a driving uh, prior. So this picture actually looks like an aerial shot or a drone shot, but it's actually the point cloud that I showed you rendered from the bird's eye. And each pixel is about two centimeters by two centimeters. Uh, but at the scale, you don't see them as pixelated, but it's really, you do see like shadows. We remove dynamic objects, so you see things like little dark holes that we use like semantic segmentation to remove uh, dynamic objects that may still be stationary. So you can clearly make out things like lanes, intersections, crosswalks. They're all colorized nicely. On this, if you run a computer vision algorithm, say extract lane markers, much easier, much more useful than the semantic segmentation or what's called front camera view of the same data. And this particular segmentation, CNN, actually gives you both the turn signals or turn restrictions and the lane markings. It's Messy, it's not perfect. Yeah. Like typical CNN outputs are inputs to our uh, vector, vector graphic generators. Now, this is again the segmentation output overlaid over the original bird's eye view image. And these are the, the yield restrictions. Now, this is an interesting uh, rendering of the LiDAR <coughs> output filtered for just dynamic objects on that same bird's eye view. I made the background gray so that you can see the, the red. But when a car moves, this is like a 10 hertz, your LiDAR is scanning. And so you will see parts of the car. If they're stopped at a left turn, they're waiting. Yeah. You can see like at least one car went by, so you see the left turn. So you see these traces. It's almost like long exposure <laughs> capture from the traffic videos you see where the tail lights of the cars are blurry. But the cool thing is you can actually look at the right lane there and say that right lane is not a right turn only lane because sometimes cars go straight through, sometimes cars turn right. <coughs> if you have enough data for any given intersection, you can count and say, ah, we saw 100 cars at that, in that lane and 33 of them turn right, 66 of them go straight. And the last one, I don't know what happened to that one, but whatever. You can then say, oh, you can set a prior and say, if you see a car in that lane, Assume 66% probability they're going to run through the intersection. 33%, uh, they're going to sort of take a right turn. So you can do things like that. Those are priors. You can't say this particular car is going to take a right turn, but you can say on average. So for prediction, it's super powerful. So I gave you some examples of priors and so on. I'll give you one final taste for the scale of, uh, of things and some of the things you can do uh, in terms of trajectories. And I'll give you an intersection example as the last one. Uh, most of the driving people will say is simple. Like even if you look at your own driving, humans also find it relatively easy. And you know, some of the challenges is sort of, uh, you know, there are things that only a few of us will ever encounter, and there are some un some known unknowns, right? Things like animal crossing are fun ones because unless you actually live in an area, you probably aren't fully aware. And then there's the the crazy town unknown unknowns. <laughs> right? I mean, this is not. This looks like. You know, this probably happens pretty often over there, but think of a parade going, right? People know, or if there's a ball game in San Francisco, you suddenly encounter things that you, you know, you have to kind of react to that you're not ready for, right? So understanding sort of the, the environment in terms of the dynamic scenarios is super important uh, to be able to then design what features the AV needs to have, also tests. In order to test an AV, you want to be able to do that. So let me run through one particular thing that's at scale, like I talked about 50 million trips a week. How can you change the way you're building self-driving cars? 
And one of the things that we've kind of wanted to solve for is there's a need to learn from humans how to drive. And somehow we have to build a machine that can automatically help the AVs learn from humans. So humans are really good at driving. This is sort of like, think of the Castro or Grandmaster games. You want to be able to learn from those in some meaningful, scalable way. So we, you know, you can talk about if you have a small fleet of AVs, you can probably map out one state. But as of right now, we have a large fleet that actually drives in most of the US. So for the problem of being able to drive more human-like, uh, you can sense the world using a large fleet of drivers. And then if you can convert that useful knowledge, I mean, kind of there's a set of pretty pictures here. You want to extract meaningful information in a scalable way and then use that to sort of accelerate the development of your car. Um, and that's the big challenge. The big challenges that are remaining are more around how do you get the AV to behave in a human So, okay, I'll see what I'm presenting. This slide is in trouble. So let me just talk through, the previous slide had uh, what we consider similar to a dash cam, a fleet device. Many of the drivers who drive for Lyft uh, actually have a dash cam for safety reasons. But you can actually think of a low end sensor, something like a cell phone camera-ish uh, thing that's available for all the Lyft drivers. Um, and available, if you have express drive, if you have rental cars, this is not an uncommon thing to have. And from that imagery, you can build 3D visual maps and Using those visual maps, you can then localize the trajectories and understand human driving behavior. One example I'll give you is how to drive through intersections. Uh, the challenge with intersections is, in most intersections, lane markings are not present. In some larger ones, they're present. And the worst part is humans do not follow uh, and keep to those lane markings. So one common example we see is when you take a, this is, Sort of these are, think of this as a visual map, and those are some of the trajectories, the, the places where the, the human drivers were, and we can solve that in an automatic way. You're solving a left turn problem, and interestingly here, you can see the people who take the left turn sometimes merge with the leftmost lane once they're done with the turn. Others actually take the rightmost lane, the two lanes run. You can predict how often one happens versus the other, and if the AV had to, what are the canonical paths that you would want to follow to go to the rightmost lane, to be, uh, then you can actually use the lane sequences and trajectories you have to actually build a path prior, a prior that helps the AV sort of say, oh, what do humans normally do? And can I use that as an input when I do my planning? Right? If, in, a lot of the planners will do trajectory generation, and this could be one of the trajectories that it explore, explores when it uh, wants to execute that left. So that's sort of, that. if you can do that in a scalable way, you can solve a lot of problems where the computer may have an ambiguous problem, but humans can actually provide the answer to, hey, in this situation, uh, let's share with you how humans solve it, and then if you can take that and augment it uh, and apply it in the algorithm, that would work. So this is another one, the final one is a, the real-time layer. Uh, I talked about how when you have a fleet of cars, each car doesn't have to solve the autonomy problem and the safety problem in isolation. Uh, the map is sort of the coordinate space that you talk to other cars. So I think of it as if you have 10 cars that are separated a quarter mile away and they can see a quarter mile out, or maybe they're 100 meters away and they can see 100 meters out, then you can actually think of a sensor that the fleet has, which has the ability to sense <coughs> across the whole visual field or sensor field for the fleet rather than just one. And you can have latencies that don't require real-time communication for that to be useful for a car. So with that, I'm just gonna like end it there. You can do things like intelligent deployment and um, we have a lot of things that, similar to the ride sharing product where we've actually brought knowledge about transportation to solving various aspects of delivering transportation in a ride, ride sharing service. We can also apply and think about how do you make uh, maybe better, safer, and build it faster by leveraging our understanding of transportation. 